All right, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for waiting. I know we say six o'clock start, but everybody's on their own standard time. So we generally always start between 6.30 and 6.45. Uh, today, it's a little tough to find this place. Even when we came here, we kind of got lost where we're supposed to go. So uh, first off, Happy New Year, Happy 2020 to everybody. Uh, thank you for coming out on January 2nd. I know it's not the most ideal time, but we are on a very compressed schedule between September 2019 to March of 2020 to get 31 of these gang prevention town halls done. Uh, my name is Ron Chinzer. I work with the Toronto Police Service. There's a uh, few of us in the room. For those of you who live in this area, we have some officers from your division here. Uh, and we also have representation from community housing. Uh, we have your local counselor, Brad Bradford. Where are you at? There he is. He's killing it. So this is the second one Brad's been out to, which is great. Brad was great the last time. He's also going to be great this time as well. And then I've spoken to most of you, some of you haven't had a chance to speak to. And generally that's what I do. Uh, whenever we start this, that half an hour leg period, I always come in and I talk to everybody. And the reason why I talk to everybody is I want to understand better from your angle what's happening on your end. All right, with city of Toronto is a massive city. People forget that it's the fourth largest city in North America, which means that in the United States and Canada, we are a big city. And sometimes people think we are immune to big city problems, which is a horrible word to attach to it, but these things happen in bigger populations, being gangs. The reason I speak to you is this is our 19th gang prevention town hall, which means we've been in 19 neighborhoods that are gang impacted or crime impacted. And what I can tell you wholeheartedly and with full confidence is no two neighborhoods are the same. Not at all. They are completely different. But generally what happens in a city this big and every major city is when there is a problem and cities look for solutions, they want to blanket a solution. All right, so if there's shootings in this case in the city's west end and the east end, the north side, the south side, they want one strategy that deals with everything. Now, that might work, but in this case here, we've been in depth in these communities and in these neighborhoods. We've spoken to many police officers and community housing officers and partner agencies that are as invested in your communities as we are, as you are. And we realized very quickly that this is not the same. All right, one street can separate two very different communities and different cultures. And that's okay, but we need to start looking at more specific issues. So the purpose of talking to you individually was to get a better understanding of where you're coming from and what the impacts are. And what I can tell you is already in this room, uh, we've had people who've lost family members to gun violence. We've had children who've been around gun violence. We've had community members who've had to deal with gun and gang violence. Um, and then we have a host of other stories, whether they be professional, personal, or other impacts, but you're here. And the point of that is even in this room for the community agencies, for the partner groups, this isn't about changing how you talk. Get that out of your head. It's not about how you talk or what language you use. It's changing how you think about things. Because really, if everything we've been doing over the last 15 and 20 years, it's been working, but we can't catch up to how it's been growing, something has to change. And it's not language. All right? We're not in the, the business of changing language. We're in the business of changing thought and ideas and effective execution of strategies. So this Integrated Gang Prevention Task Force came up about three years ago. And how it came up was our deputy chief, one of them out of the four, and for those of you who aren't familiar with what a deputy chief is in the Toronto Police Service, because I know all these titles, they kind of lose people. It's as simple as this. Uh, I want you to imagine Walmart. Walmart has a president or a CEO. All right, that's our chief of police. And underneath that CEO, you have four vice presidents. Now those four vice presidents are all in charge of different things. And Walmart, one might be in charge of shipping, one might be in charge of receiving, one might be in charge of hiring, one might be in charge of sales. Well, in Toronto, we have the same thing, but instead of four vice presidents, we have four deputy chiefs. Now, the one deputy chief that we work under, under organized crime enforcement, is Deputy Chief Jim Raymer. And in December of 2016, he'd gone, traveled quite a bit in Canada, had come back to Toronto and said, we need to take our gun and gang strategy to another level. And that other level was initially, how do we get a gang member out of a gang? So my partner, Detective Jason Condo, was tapped on the shoulder and they said to Jason, we need to figure out how to do this. And I had worked the gun and gang task force with Staff Sergeant McDonnell, who now works for Community Housing, he was actually my boss, the worst boss I ever had. I'm so sorry, boss. <laughs> no, no, he was second worst boss I ever had. That being said, though, we had a good collection and we said, all right, we need to figure out a way to get guys out of gangs. I ran into Jason, we had a conversation. I said, 100%, this is what I'm into. And I had multiple reasons, but my reasons don't matter. It's not about me today, it's about you. <clears throat> and we decided to embark on this adventure and we said, all right, we're going to really try to figure out how to get a gang member out of a gang. It was, it was a real noble sentence to work with. It was great, something great to put on a resume, something great to talk about, something great to tell your friends about, but 
<clears throat> very quickly we realized this is uh, potentially a pipe dream. Right? And it's sad to say, I'm just going to be open and honest with you. I'm going to tell you the, the honesties about all the places we failed. And the, the point of that is to, <laughs> is to pass it off so you don't make the same mistakes we made. And hopefully you're ahead of the game and hopefully in the interest of open and honest conversations, if you've done something that's worked, you share it back to not just us, but to the room. So we can start amassing different things that actually work. Yeah, different things that work on an individual level. And when this idea came up of how do we get a gang member out of a gang, Jason's been part of the Gunna Gang Task Force for 15 years. Uh, staff, how long were you there? You were there for a long time too. 14, 14 years. I was only there for, uh, for two or three years. And we would spoke to a whole bunch of people that we respected in the Gunna Gang investigative side of policing, not just in Toronto, but outside agencies. We just spoke to him at the beginning and said, hey guys, we kind of got this plan and we need to figure out how to get a gang member out of a gang. And everybody we spoke to kind of had the same things. All right, and we can kind of canvas people as well and we say, okay, what would you do? And I want you to think about this. And, and we had to really think differently. And what we realize is, as we're talking to people, being police officers, and we said to them, how do you get a gang member out of a gang? They were giving us very human responses, quote unquote. So I'll ask you here, if I were to ask you how to get a gang member out of a gang, what would you say? Yeah, no, I, I actually canceled them last month. I, had, I got sick and I couldn't meet up with them, but we're going to meet. But what you're saying in essence, and this is an important part because we've looked at this in depth as well through a psychological side, is, is there's an imbalance. Yeah. Right? The imbalance is the need to survive and then poor decision making. Right. Right? That's what it is. And, and there's, how do you balance that? And on the topic of balance, I mean, the people here who have experience with gang members, are they impulsive people? I'm talking the violent gang members. Okay? We're not talking about the... the the entire portion of, of gang membership. We're talking about the, the most violent, the most impactful, the ones that are shooting, killing, uh, drug dealing, organizing the drug dealing, and recruiting young kids into it. Um, are they, would you say, impulsive people? Is there a lack of balance? Are they making decisions in line with surviving? Probably not. Right? It's very much in a fight or flight response system, and it's a, a very hostile environment. I can tell you myself, Jason, uh, some other people, we've had the opportunity to debrief hundreds of gang members. Jason has debriefed thousands. Uh, I've debriefed quite a bit. Boss back there has debriefed and there's some other officers here and some other people who've, who've had intimate conversations. And I'll ask you here in an open forum, is there, can you not feel the sense of anxiety <laughs> and PTSD that pops in the room? You deal with them, they're on, this is, this is redlining it to every hour of your day. And that is, is so exhausting and tiring. And it has real physical effects. You have adrenal fatigue, you have cortisol imbalances, you have really poor decision making, you have poor health, you have a, have a ton of issues. And when you're dealing with somebody who's living on that in a stage of adolescence, being that they don't really understand what's actually happening, the full development has and happened in the brain, which before we thought it was 18, now it's looking like it's 25. And you're living in this fight or flight response, a legitimate one, they don't understand flight. The eerie similarities between all of us, not just police officers, but I want you to think back here for those of you that have had some impacts which brought you out today. When you were going through that moment or you'd heard the bad news, just think back to what that felt like. And for those of you who haven't experienced it, think back to the worst part of your life. Just think back to the worst news you ever got and, and remember that feeling because I'm sure you're not going to forget it. And now imagine living that feeling every day. And that goes both ways. It goes to gang members and it goes to police officers. Right, and there's this, there's this heightened sense of there's a responsibility that lies on the police to deal with gang violence. And 100%, we're there for gang violence. But when we talk about gang prevention, we are not the answer. I promise you we are not the answer. And I will never advocate that police are the answer to gang prevention. And I'll tell you why as we go forward. So with us, when we were a professional organization, a law enforcement organization, deemed with the idea, how do you get a gang member out of your gang? I want you to think about this. Who comes from a business background? Anybody? Business background, business, one, two, three. So let's talk organization. You have to identify a target population. You have to identify a service you're going to give to them. And you have to identify where you're going to go. Is risk management an issue you'd look at for something like this? Risk management is huge, right? What happens in uh, Toronto if I say, if I were to say hypothetically when they said gang prevention, get gang members out of gangs, and I said, what would I be called? 100%. And that would be racist. All right, that would be. We can do that. So we have to look at a couple things to be objective. Because in this method, once we realize that for canvassing people that had the similar response that you had when it came down, how do we get gang members out of a gang? 
we have to start to grow this a little bit because we realize, hey man, the solutions can't be this simple. And they're not. But they are simple, but they're not. And it's a weird thing. And what we found was we had to look at a couple things. So the first thing is, is we had to look at when it came to getting gang members out of a gang is, well, what is a gang? So I'll ask you here, if you were to define a gang, what is it? Because again, we have to look at what we're looking at. So we have to get gang members out of a gang. So let's focus on, first let's look at what is a gang? Group of bullies. Family. Family. What else? What is a gang? Group of bullies, a family. Community. It's a community, right? <laughs> but what do they do? Live life. <laughs> it's almost the dream, eh? It is the dream. Look, he's already piqued my interest to switch sides, all right? Live life tax free. I could be living a, a way more fruitful life. All right. And what else? Some, you had your hand up, sir? So, yes, yeah, sir. Uh, organization and a business. Group of associates. So we've got a lot of different things, but we have to look at a real academic and empirical base. And we wanted an objective lens. We don't want to take the subjective lens of what a police see, because we realize really quick, this is not a police problem. Just like I told you, this is, we're part of the solution. We are not the solution, 100%. This is what they actually do. <laughs> three things in every gang all over the world. Right, these are the three things that's the commonality in every gang. They deal drugs, they collect debt, and they control the territory. Every gang does this in the entire world. It's not my opinion, this is academically sourced. Okay, so they control the territory. What do they control the territory for? Drugs. They deal drugs. And why do they collect debt? It's drug debt. There's dealers on there. Dealers can't afford $20,000 up front. Not the dealers that we're looking at, right? And, and while we're looking at street gangs, there are also levels of gangs above them, organized crime groups that, that's a whole different ball game. But for us, it's the street gangs. It's the ones that are pulling the triggers every day in and out of the city of Toronto that are killing people. Those are the ones we wanna focus on right now. There's a whole back end, we'll figure that out as well. We have things to do that. But for now, we know the three things. So if it's a group of bullies and they're not doing this, not a gang. If they're tax free, they're just smarter than us. All right, as long as they're not doing this, that's okay. But if these three are in existence, now we're looking at what we should be looking at in terms of the group and who do we want to target effectively. Now gangs do many other things. What else do they do? Extortion, what else? Kidnapping. Kidnapping. Sex trade. Sex trade, human trafficking. What other things do gangs do? When you think of gang crime? It could be movies, it could be what you've seen. Sorry? Bootleg. Bootleg stuff, right? They make fake stuff. <clears throat> do they do murder? Do they do shootings? Do they do threatening? Do they break into people's houses? Do they steal cars? Do they steal from stores? Do they, <laughs> do they, extor do they do witness intimidation? Gangs do much more than this, but these three have to exist. They are the core of everything. They might do a murder, but it might be related to this. Yes, sir. So children using drugs is a whole other issue, all right? But I want to paint a perspective into you, and the perspective here is balance. Is growing, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you right now. I don't know the numbers, and I don't want to tell you something that I don't know for sure. But I will tell you this. Um, <clears throat> when it comes down to the drug legalization, and in every argument that everybody makes in the history of time, the opposition in the argument is always a perfect scenario. <laughs> the opposition is always a, what, a balanced scenario. It's always a balanced scenario. So drug legalization, the arguments made back against it are in a balanced scenario, this works perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well no, listen, there's so, many, there's so many ways you can go with that. In, in previously communist countries, the switch over to democracy actually created organized crime. Yeah. Right? That's, that's, that's substantiated everywhere. Leaving a communist state and becoming democratic created a whole new pocket for organized crime groups that popped in and created things like human trafficking, drug trafficking, having to pay out insurance payments to different countries like in Bulgaria, for example, as soon as they switched over, they had a separate black hat insurance company that came in and said, if you don't pay us insurance, well, we're gonna, your car's gonna go missing and it went missing. And the next day they knock on your door and say, okay, well, if you wanna pay insurance, we'll get your car back. And they forced people to do into that. If you wanna look at drug legalization or non-criminalization, look at San Francisco right now. It's one of the most beautiful cities in the world but they have a massive epidemic right now because it wasn't executed in balance. And th there are answers and solutions, but everything's gotta be done in balance. And when it comes down to drugs, you have issues like addictions and then the legalization of it, you have many other issues. You're talking in terms of the perspective being from the person dealing the drugs or possessing the drugs, but you have to look at the net value and the net impact of what about the family members for those that are drug addicted. Anybody here who has a family member that's addicted to drugs or alcoholic, 
How, how terrible is that for you guys? It's, ter- it's the worst, man. It is the worst. I have alcoholic in my family, and uh, it's, it's, it's not fun for anybody, right? And it's in, if you were to look at it and we'd say, okay, we're going to legalize drugs, and again, this is a, a non-balanced scenario for the other end of it, but the reality is that stuff exists. And there, there's so many venues you can go down with the drug legalization and all these other things where we have to look at Yes. So uh, before we, let's put a plug in this. We'll come back to this later. No, no, it's okay. I just want to end off on this one thing about this certain topic. And it's stuff we've, we've seen. I, I read this uh, article recently about the United States and uh, combating the Mexican cartel, right? And the combat against the Mexican cartel. One of the arguments made was legalize marijuana. You've now, which all the states are doing, right? Illinois just became the last state, I think, on Christmas or something like that. So Merry Christmas to Illinois. Uh, but uh, the decriminalization for marijuana has put a dent in the Mexican cartel. But you know what they replaced it with? Heroin. Heroin. No, heroin. So they've realized that the, so now they're growing heroin in Mexico and it comes as a distinct color and they've tracked it as far up as Boston, Massachusetts. So their Mexican heroin has popped up up there because they realize, okay, the marijuana trade is dumb for it. We're going to amp it up. And, and what is chemically more addictive and more destructive than marijuana? Heroin. So I'm saying the balance, right? You have to look at an objective perspective onto it. But regardless of all that, Back to what we're doing, three things got to be in play, all right? And that's what they do. And they're all in play for money. That's what it is. It's for income. And income supplies something else. And the second part was who joins gangs. So if I were to ask you here to describe somebody who joins a gang, what would you say? Or how would you describe that person to me? So if I were to ask you here, and I do this exercise everywhere, I'll do it here with you. And uh, I'll just preface this now, all right? And the preface is this. Listen, we got to be open and honest here, all right? I'm, I'm not in the business of... I mean, obviously, I want you to feel good, feel motivated when you leave here, but I'm also not going to BS you on this, and I, I don't want you to BS me back. You got to just be real with me and just tell me what you think, because the sooner we can all collectively just tell the truth, at least as we know it, the better we're going to be. And what I mean by telling the truth is just saying your experience and your thoughts, what they are. And the reason why you do that is not to say boo or shame on you. It's to say, hey, your thoughts are real too. Your experience is 100% that could be real to you, but they might not be true universally. And the, the, the easier we can get that out there, the better we can be working towards a solution. So if I were to go into my pocket and I pull out this magic pill, and I tell you this magic pill, I'm going to give it to somebody. And when I give it to them, we're going to change our life. This has got to be a gang member. We're going to give it to them. They're going to swallow this pill. And right away, instantly, their life's going to change. They're going to come from a really low income area where they were a gang member their whole life. They're a gang leader. And... When they take this pill, their life changes and they, they say, you know what? They come up with this billion dollar entrepreneurial idea. They create a business here in the community that you live in. They employ thousands of people to high paying jobs. They help get kids through schools. They do amazing things. There's a statue of them. And in 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, everything to say, man, that kid changed his life and he changed his entire neighborhood. I got this pill. I got one hour to give him this pill. We got to do two things. One, we need to tell him, where do we go in the city of Toronto? So where do I go? We got one hour. We're going to change this kid's life and thousands of other family lives. Uh, what does this kid look like? Let's go with sex. Is it a boy or a girl? girl. It's a girl. Everybody good with a girl? Yep. Thank you. Remember, listen, this is the highest measure of success. We only got one pill. We got to make sure we get the right person here. So it definitely has to be a girl. Everybody okay with a girl? Yep. Yes, sir. Okay. Yep. With a girl gang member. One pill. You good with it? Girls organizing in my building more than men. Okay. Okay, we'll go with that, all right? So. 10 out of 90. 10 out of 90. Actually, in some provinces, it's zero. Some provinces, as high as 12. Oh, you should come to my building. That's my experience. Okay. But we're not in your building. We're in Regent Park. Okay. Wow. We're not in your building. We're in Regent Park. I just want to make sure we're good with it. We're going to change this person's life. We've got to make sure we get the right person. It's a girl? Yeah. All right. It's a girl. Now, what are, how old is this girl in Regent Park? 12, 15, teenage, let's go, uh, you guys good, 15 to 18, 15, 18 year old girl, and uh, does she wear certain types of clothing? Well, listen, we're going to change this person's life, so I don't want you to think about this, all right, the point of this is just to say, we're not here to say I'm holier than thou, 
say it is what it is. We're going to change this person's life, but I got to be accurate in who I'm looking for. This is target identification. We got to make sure we're going to give this one pill. Walmart closing because she can't afford anything else. Black girl, 15 to 18, Walmart clothing. So Walmart has George, right? That's clothing in Walmart, George. So she's got George clothing and, and describe the clothing to me so I know who to look for. Jeans it's a big a area. Fancy blouse. So jeans and a fancy George blouse. Um, okay, and then she's, uh, let's see, how many cell, does she have one cell phone or two cell phones? She's not working? Two phones? Two phones, and um, does she have earbuds in? Is there music in the earbuds? What type of music is in the earbuds? Hip hop music? Louder ones, loud music. So we're good at hip hop music? Two cell phones, George clothing, 15 year old black girl in Regent Park. Does she make this music herself? Is she an artist? Like, she... I don't know, is she? You guys gotta tell me. I, I don't, I'm just phoning, I'm just. So now we got 20 minutes. We have 20 minutes. Okay. Is she wearing anything on her head? She has a beanie on her head? Uh, does she have any jewelry? <coughs> she has jewelry, definitely. What kind of jewelry is it? Gold. Does she walk a certain way or talk a certain way? She's an, she has an attitude. Okay, perfect. So I think we're pretty good, but we're missing one part here. What color is her skin? I never said black. Oh, did I say black? I, I said it before, but I didn't say it now. So what color is her skin color? Ah, but we're not here, but could be. I got 10 minutes now, and I got to give this girl a pill. And it's going to change her life and thousands of other people's lives. But I got to make sure I'm giving the pill to the right person. So... Okay, so we're gonna go mixed what? Lots of mixes. Mixed, mixed what? Mixed what? Mixed. What is mixed race though? Black and white mixed race. No, Musa's black, black and white mixed race. Are we good? Now we're down to one minute. Are we a hundred percent sure this is the person we're gonna give this magic? This is the gang member. So she just hangs out in one area. Yeah. That's Regent Park. Okay, we're going to say that's where she's at. Okay, so guys, I have 10 seconds. Are you 100% sure this is what we want to give it to? I'm, I'm good with it. Just are you guys good with it? I'm not good with it. Anybody else not good with it? She's going to be the mother of future children, right? So I'm good with it. What about anything else you'd want to change, or we're good? Just male? Change the sex from female to male? Uncomfortable? Deal. Clothing? What do you think we'd change the clothing to? Uh, <clears throat> like a Walmart shirt top, like just something you know, they make the money to wear whatever they they're in. They don't want anyone looking at them and saying like, all right, like you have to be wearing something. But there is a Walmart. There's some OVO on there. Actually, there is a Walmart. But we're talking about like a gang leader. Yeah. Right, you can't do it. Yeah. So who's selling her the designer stuff then? <coughs> <laughs> they work for her. Yeah, they got yeah. money. She's making enough money. She's making good money. You can go yeah. buy from anywhere other than Walmart. That's uh, what they're trying to say. Okay, so but just by... Uh, the design, whoever's selling the designer stuff works for her. That's what I think. Well, I think she just buys it from Yorkdale. Yeah. Potentially. Walmart, they work for her. Okay, so here, let's just go by raise of hands. Uh, who's okay with it being a female? We have five seconds left. i got to give her this pill. I mean, we're going to change our life, okay? And then what about male? Okay, so male. All right, now I give this person this pill. And the reason I do that, the reason I do this is in 19 of these that we've done, this is now the second one, but in all of them, I've just opened it up, and all of them with the exception of very few small details, every description, regardless of the makeup of the community that we're in, could be all black, could be all brown, could be all, it doesn't matter. Every description was given, with the exception of these two, was a 15 to 18 year old black. You've heard of it, right? That's that. Now let me ask you this: If I were to take that description, and let's use the one I give, we did today that we all made collectively, and I were to park and I find a 15 to 18 year old black kid, a boy, who's listening to hip hop, who's got two cell phones, who's wearing nice clothing, and I say, "Come with me, kid. You're a gang member. I'm going to change your life." 
How many kids in that neighborhood look like that that have nothing to do with gangs? Probably like 98%, 99% of kids that look like that in what we consider gang impacted neighborhoods are not that. But the idea is, unless we can force this junk out and actually address it and talk about it, rather than not say anything and say what we want to say to look good, we're never going to have a solution here. So as much as people don't want to say what they're feeling or saying what they're thinking or, or say that because they don't want to look ignorant or whatever you want to do or whatever your perspective, it doesn't matter. We're not doing any favors to anybody. We're just walking out of here feeling good, giving ourselves a pat on the back. I'm not in the business of that. Our job is to stop this from happening. So to stop this from happening, we have to get the junk out there and clean it up and say, garbage, 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 garbage. And what we know is, we know that's not a fact. And I'll tell you what does matter when it comes down to gangs and gang memberships and who joins gangs. And one of those areas is definitely location. You've got a map of the city of Toronto there. The city of Toronto was broken up into 140 neighborhoods. 31 of those neighborhoods are called low equity neighborhoods or neighborhood improvement areas or NIAs. Right? And this was broken up, and this was done from the city of Toronto, I think in 2014, 15, and 16. And what they looked at on this map is they said, where are the neighborhoods that are considered low equity? And what low equity means is they're under an acceptable standard on many different things, being what is the average median income in the household? Uh, what does the family home look like? Uh, are parents first generation or new immigrant Canadians? Uh, what are their access to economic opportunities in terms of physical location access, do they have access to subway TTC, high employing jobs, and all these other things. But what they came down to is they found these 31 low equity neighborhoods. And we'd come across this map and on our own, we took a crime map and we wanted to say, where's the gang activity in the city? And again, objective, right? We didn't want to go with where we thought. And what we found is, funny enough, these 31 low equitable neighborhoods that are in lower economic opportunity areas are also the same areas where we have gangs and gang crime. That's not by coincidence, okay? There is some, something happening here, and we know what that something happening is. So how we ended up in these 31 low equity neighborhoods, how we ended up in your neighborhood out of all these town halls was exactly looking at this map. For two years, we had developed these high-level partnerships on many different avenues and many different things, and they kind of went nowhere for many different reasons. And after two years, we sat down and we thought about it, and we do a lot of thinking. So if you ever come to our office and you sit down with us, there's days when we're just talking and thinking and talking and thinking because you got to think about things. And I'll ask you, when's the last time you actually sat down and thought about something? People just drive to conclusions. Yes, sir. So with this uh, and us coming to these neighborhoods, what we realize is over the last, this is our, th we're over three years now in understanding the space and learning. And we've learned a lot. And the first two years, we really learned on, on greater impacts, which I'll tell you later. But what we, what we realized after two years of that is, the, the people we never engaged the most was the most gang impacted people themselves, the people that live in these communities, or the community members. So we said, you know what, we're going to jump into these 31 low equity neighborhoods. Our target market is exactly who's here in terms of social agencies, partner groups, other people that want to come in and find out what's happening. Some people had said there's no youth here. <coughs> we're not stupid. Gang involved youth are not going to show up to a gang prevention town hall. That's not who we wanted. We wanted community leaders, we wanted champions, we wanted people impacted and victimized by crime. We wanted other parents to come in. We wanted people who could influence kids at the household level in terms of a mentorship role. We're not stupid, we're not gonna get gang kids here. We get them at different places like schools. But in this place here, we wanted to aggressively interact with the communities, find community leaders, which we have you here today, and then build on strategies going forward with you. For example, for us to advertise and market in areas like this, we, we try our best, but we're police officers, we're not marketing gurus. All right, we use word of mouth, but now going forward, we know who to leverage in the community. Do you not have a network? You do. So why would we waste 90% of our effort trying to build trust in communities that have historically not trusted police for their own reasons? I could waste 90% of my time doing that, but I'm 90% of the way from doing what I'm supposed to do. The idea is to find the people who already have that trust and empower them to get the job done. But when it comes down to actual gang members and what happens for a kid from the age of zero all the way up to 21, because that's the number I'll use, because I don't think it's 18 anymore, I think it's 21, is we found an objective lens, and the objective lens is this. It's the risk factor. So you have it here, right? There's this uh, laminated card you have in front of you. Those are gang risk factors. And where they came from was in 2007, Public Safety Canada published this academic publication called Youth Gang Risk Factors. And it was done by PhDs and academics in the field that looked all over the world and said, what are the commonalities between gang members? What is happening with them? And if you look at them, they're broken down into five categories and there's 36 risk factors. 
and they all happen at different times and they're relatively easy to spot and easy to predict. So rather than looking at things like skin color, intersections, clothing, type of music they listen to, type of clothing, that stuff doesn't work because we already agreed that 99% of people who look like that have nothing to do with this. There's many reasons why somebody who lives in those communities would dress like that. One of them being that if I don't look like this, I'm going to be a victim of a crime. The other one being this is a culture. The other one being that this is what well, my friends dress like. I'm going to dress like that. They're kids. That's okay. But we have to look objective. If we're going to target this and combat this and we're going to find kids that will become gang members, we have to be objective and real with how we're going to do this. And you have those risk factors in front of you. And they're split up into five categories, being family, school, peer group, individual, and community. And they happen at different times. And you have in front of you, and if you look at it, is there anything on there that says race, gender, age, religious background, ethnic belief? Is any of those on there? No. No, that stuff does not matter at all. That is zero. That's nonsensical. That stuff matters, but not at the beginning. You know where it matters? It matters with what do we do after. So what if we have a gang kid that says, I want to get out of this lifestyle? You know when it does matter? What their religious beliefs are? Then it matters. When, what their sex is? Then it matters. What they believe in? Then it matters. Because we have to do stuff that's in line with what they already believe in. For example, I can't say to a kid who's of the Islamic faith who wants to get out of a gang to do the same things necessarily than a kid who's Catholic or Christian or Sikh or any other religion. It might not work in there, but we need to understand what do you believe in? What is your religious background? What is your compass or your values? And what are the deeper <laughs> issues that you're facing? Most importantly, the underlying issues are we need to know what these risk factors are for each individual kid. So for six months, Jason and I went down and we spoke to over 2,000 frontline police officers in the city of Toronto. And we gave them a crash course on these risk factors and we talked to them and we said, listen, if in the course of your duties, if you're out there patrolling, if you're in a uniform like Dale and you're a community involved officer or you're just a regular officer and you're going out and you come across kids or young adults that are going down this path and didn't realize it, this is what you need to look out for and if you get it, can you call us? And if they agree to, to seeking out some sort of help, can you call us? And it did. We got a whole bunch of calls. We had over the last three years about 75 uh, kids being uh, uh, between the ages of 10 and 21 that were referred to us in a gang exit strategy. And unfortunately, out of the 75, we only had one success story. I thought we had two up until last week. And up until last week, we found out the uh, second kid that we, we, we thought was a success got arrested for a, uh, a homicide and had a, a gun with him in another city. It was, it was very disappointing, but it, it shows you the power of the beast. All right? And I'm going to go over what these risk factors are and give you a real life example of one of the 75 kids that is a gold model for this is what's up. And actually, I'm going to change it up. I'm going to give you the story of the kid who, who got arrested for the murder and uh, possession of a firearm uh, a month ago, who we had a, uh, we had a solid relationship with. And, and uh, I would have never saw this coming, but it did. <clears throat> now, the risk factor category of family, I believe there's like eight risk factors in there. All right? And if you look at them, they're very simple and they're very easy to see. And this kid in particular, this kid is one of four kids, but he's the oldest kid. Right? He's the oldest kid. And he's in his house. He's from another country. He was an infant when he was brought over here, but he's here with his mother, lives in community housing. And from a very young age, he's kind of on his own. All right? Mom has her own issues. I mean, I want you to imagine this. You're a mother of four. You live in community housing. The father to the kids is in another country. Can't come over to Canada for whatever reason. They live in community housing, and they've been this one pocket for 20 plus years. All right, now your oldest 18 year old, for whatever reason, um, decides to join a gang and then ultimately commit a murder, allegedly at this point here. But with this kid here, we had intimate dealings with him and I'll tell you his story. So mom says, at the age of three, this kid being the oldest, and for all of us here who have kids, I want you to think about this, mom says this kid at the age of three was a pain in her butt. Or really bad behavioral problems. And at the age of three, in the family risk factor category, this is the biggest thing to look out for. Right? This is the biggest one. It's the behavior. I mean, we're talking about a three-year-old. Not the three-year-old who pees all over the toilet seat. I'm talking about the one who punches things, who kicks things, who yells, who bites, who doesn't listen to anything. That should be a flag that something is not okay. And I know it's about gang prevention, but it's not about to say that this three-year-old's a gang member. It's saying, hey, you got to open up. There's something else happening here. This is nobody else's problem at this point. here. You got to look at this and deal with this aggressively. But in this case here, mom says, man, this guy was out of control. I couldn't even control him. He's three years old. And this kid, and, I, and for the parents in the room, when you're washing your dishes, like how old is this little one here? Two and a half. 
She's doing, she's almost three, right? So let's say you guys are home washing the dishes and you hear her and she's playing. Is she okay? She's okay, right? She's playing. You can kind of hear what she's doing. What happens when you don't hear anything? She, she's up to something, right? So what do we do as parents? We turn off the water, we go sneak around, boom, we kick in the door and they're doing something wrong. Yeah. We guys gotcha, gotcha. Now I want you to picture this kid on the end of it. Now here's something for all of us here. <coughs> And this is uh, psychologically proven in brain and biology and behavior and a lot of the good stuff. From the age of zero to seven, we all operate on what's called a theta wave. It's a state of hypnosis. And we're gathering information, all right? We're, we're layering the subconscious mind. And what this does is it tells you we need to start gathering information from us to operate. And we need to operate in terms of not what we need to do to succeed, but what do we need to do to survive? The Neanderthal part of our brain. And we're just collecting data. This is what I need to survive. This is what I need to survive not to succeed. So this kid's already building that firing and wiring in the brain. And what that firing and wiring is, is this. For newborn babies, what happens if you don't hold them? What happens if newborn babies don't get held for two or three days? They die. They physically die, right? So there's an innate connection, an innate need to, to something. But this kid, he's three years old. He's the oldest. Mom already has number two and number three on the way. And this kid's only three, maybe even four. So mom says, man, this is the kid. I yell at him, and he knows he gets attention because every time he does something naughty, mom stops washing the dishes, yells at him, and he's already building that in his brain. This behavior equals this response. This behavior equals mom yelling at me. Now this kid, he goes from the family risk factor category, which there's about eight of them. All of a sudden, this kid goes to school. So at three, you notice the big behavioral problems, all right, the ones that you can't neglect. Those are not okay. And then at the age of six, the biggest indicator here is school failure. So grade six is grade one or kindergarten, depending on what month you're born in, all right, or six years old of age. So now you have a six-year-old who's in grade one or kindergarten, that's failing. And I know it's Toronto and everybody says you can't fail school in here, but there's a big difference in succeeding and passing. This kid passes, he doesn't succeed. Now, why doesn't he succeed? In this kid's particular case, he goes to school, and when he's in grade one, he's that same kid that he is back at home. He's naughty, he's uncontrollable. And I want you to think back when you were in grade one or grade two, I still remember I had two kids in my class and they would just punch my sandwiches, just mush them. I want nothing to do with these guys, all right? Now this kid is that same kid in grade one. And what happens to him? Who's the replacement for mom in a school environment? That's a teacher. Teachers are amazing people, but that's very difficult. Teachers got 25 other kids to deal with. So this kid is a terror in school at grade one. And what does the teacher do? Pulls him off to the side, sets two separate EAs. If they got him educational assistance to help out this kid, and now this kid gets pulled away from the rest of the group. And now he's isolated on his own, he gets one-on-one -on -one care. So the firing and wiring, that theta wave, the zero to seven, it's starting to cement itself to say, not only at home, but when I go other places and there's a replacement from mom, this behavior equals this result. But what else is being cemented is isolation is okay. You know, what is the point of school? Like, what is the point of Montessori? If you think about the younger ages, your kid's not gonna be a doctor because they went to Montessori school. All right, that's just the reality. Your kid's gonna go to those schools to develop good social habits. How do I interact with other people? How do I develop language? Where do I fit in in a group? That's kind of what school is for at that young of an age. It's not really to develop hard study habits. It's to do that stuff. But this kid, when he gets to school, he's isolated. He's on his own. All right, so he comes home. He's failing school. Mom's already busy. Mom doesn't know any better. All right, and this is not to blame mom. This is just to say she doesn't know. There's no manual, really, for kids. I mean, there's hundreds of books on kids and parenting, but none of them have got it perfectly right. Everybody kind of just does what they do. I mean, for the parents here, do you not raise your kids kind of the way you were raised? Subtract the horrible parts that sometimes come up, that sometimes you feel regret about? Yeah, it's the same thing. So this guy is being parented by somebody who probably has a lot of issues on her own. Yes, or many are, right? There's, there's differences. So three years old, problem at home, six years old, failing school, and nine years old, then you get the peer group. Or it's the city of Toronto. Um, I could tell you when I was nine years old, my rule at home was I got to be home before the streetlights come on. All right. But it's, it's Toronto now, man. Look, my kids is, are eight and 10 and they can't go anywhere without me there. They're stuck to my hip. But the city of Toronto, is it not uncommon in community housing to see five, six, seven year old kids playing on their own in the lobby? Am I talking something so crazy right now that doesn't exist? No, it doesn't. So this kid that we're dealing with, now he's nine years old, he's on his own. Mom says to him, you got too much energy, get the hell out of here. This kid jumps out, he gets out, he goes on his own. And when he's on his own, he goes to the lobby of the building that he lives in. He comes across other kids. Are they more like him or less like him? They're more like him. 
And for the first time in this nine-year-old's life, he's come across a group of kids the exact same as him. All right? Exact same. Now, I want you to think about that. Zero to nine, you, you can't connect to anybody. All right? You got no connection to anybody. Yeah, you got a connection to mom, but that's a forced connection at some points. Mom's got her own issues. You don't even have a connection to your siblings because you don't even know how to work with siblings. You don't know how to work with anybody else. You're so focused on you. Then you come across at the age of nine in a lobby, man, I found people just like me. Or you get this, you get this rat pack of kids running around at the age of eight or nine, right? Running around, running around. And has anybody seen that in their building or in their neighborhood? You see them running around, like kind of like lawless little kids, just running around. And the biggest indicator here, so three, we see naughty behavior. Six, we see them failing the school. Nine, what do we see? We see childhood delinquency. And it's a word we took from the states because it's the biggest indicator. And what childhood delinquency means is this. What do you call it when a nine-year-old is in school and pushes another nine-year-old and takes their lunch money and says, if you tell anybody, I'm going to punch you? What do we call that? Bullying. bullying, right? Terrible bullying. You know what that's called if you're over the age of 12? It's called robbery and extortion and threatening. Child delinquency is criminal acts being practiced under the age of 12. But we just give it the soft word of bullying and say, whoa, 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 boys being boys sometimes. In this kid's case, right? Boys being boys. It happens. And then they just get sheltered through. It gets tolerated through. And then between 9 and 15, we have something massive happening. Or right, something happens between 9 and 15. Yeah, it's a mix of puberty. It's a mix of finding yourself. It's a mix of getting older, feeling independent. But at 15, the biggest indicator is they'll tell you they're a gang member. You just ask them, are you a gang member? Yep. Look at their Instagram. Look at their Twitter. Look at their Facebook if they're on it. If you look at their YouTube channel, it's blasted in front of you. you got to be blind not to see who you're dealing with. Right? And between 9 and 15, it's many different things. With this kid in particular, right. so you got to look at this. It's not just gang members. It's who are their affiliates, who are their friends. There are people that associate with gangs that are not gang members. For many reasons. In this case here, it bought him a lot of credibility. He says, I don't deal with drugs. I don't shoot people. I don't do that stuff. I just hang out with these guys and all hip-hop stuff. I represent these guys. Because it's the only way I can get out of here. And he's got a real opportunity in front of him, unfortunately, at the time. So how we connected was through something else that connected us that said, hey, we got a kid who's in this lifestyle but not in it. He's got a real opportunity to change his life, but he doesn't know how to escape it. He doesn't know how to escape it. So we get in there and we have a, a full sit down with him and his, uh, his family, being his mom and his siblings. And we have a, it's all confidential. We have a, a good sit down. We, and and the, what we do with him is we said, you got to break your habits. All right, we got to start small, the mindfulness part to it. We got to start small because the reality is here, those of us here who drink coffee every day, anybody here drink coffee every day? It's a must have, must have. What happens if you don't get your coffee in the morning? Withdrawals. Withdrawals. <laughs> Are you fun to deal with in the morning if you don't have a coffee? Nah, not at all. What about yourself? No. Terrible, right? Brad? Not good. Not good. Cranky. Cranky. <laughs> That's coffee, right? Co just think about it. We're adults here. We're all here because we care. We're, listen, we're established in what we do. We're professionals. <laughs> We got it all together, but you don't get that one cup of coffee in a day. Your mood is <coughs> built. Nope. All right, so for you who drink coffee, if I were to tell you, if you said, listen, I get crazy migraines at noon, I can't sleep at night, and I would say, okay, the solution is just don't have the coffee in the morning, how long would you last? <coughs> Sorry? I'm, I'm on <coughs> You're on seven weeks. Several weeks, I, you know, I just had to give up coffee. Like you had to give it up. <laughs> so you're strong-willed. You, you're so strong-willed, you got it down to the hour, seven weeks and 13 hours. Mm -hmm. is that's how important it is to you. So if I ask you now, if we can't even do that among each other, what is the expectation for the 17-year-old? Let's be realistic here. What are we expecting? All right, this guy's been through a lifetime of horrible experiences and, and thought processes that are so subconscious that he has no control unless he actually puts the effort to start controlling what is my next step. That's effort. That's effort we're asking for this kid. So with this kid in particular... Uh, what, we, what we pin out is two of the three homicides he had seen and both times he was abducted at gunpoint was at a convenience store across the street. And he goes there every day at the same time. And he hangs out there every day from like 4 to 6 p.m. So right away when I flagged that, I'm like, why do you go there every day? And he's like, well, it's where all the homies are. It's where all his friends are. And he goes, and I got to eat. This guy eats once a day. Right? That's just, everything else is nonsensical for him. So he goes and eats once a day. So he goes, I go there at 4 o'clock. I buy my food. I eat. I hang out with my friends. And then, and then the rest of the night, I do what I got to do. So I have to be realistic with him. So I say, all right, man. You go there seven days a week. You've seen two murders there. You were kidnapped there at gunpoint. Can we take that down to five days a week? 
And he was, uh, and his response back to me was, well, how am I going to eat the other two days? All right. Hilarious, but he legitimately didn't know what he was going to do for those other two days. So I had to say, look, man, either find another spot and I'll find it for you. Or on Friday, you buy enough for Saturday, Sunday. Are we good with that? He's like, yeah, I think I can do it. So we got a real motivated person here. All right. So for a month, we check in with him. He's like, I didn't go Saturday, Sunday. I didn't go Saturday, Sunday. Boom. He's good with it. He's good with it. And then with him, he's the only one where we committed to helping them relocate. So the family gets relocated, all right? And we had strict conditions on it. We don't do that all the time because it actually can make the problem much worse. It doesn't solve the issue in that. But this kid here, self-identified as not a gang member, but self-identified as somebody who's affiliated to gangs. But then we get to here, right? And this is the, the community problem. So as we go up, you got family, you got school, peer group, individual, self-admission, and this horrible lifestyle that happens and we have many other stories about terrible circumstances in which kids end up in this light which will do nothing but depress you and I don't want to depress everybody here but the reality is we get to this point here right now where it's a community problem right and the community problem is a, is a funny one because the community problem is all of these things compounded into something at the age of 18 <coughs> and we have shootings happening in random places we have shootings happening at all times of the day and all different types of neighborhoods and now it's a problem agreed all right, so when did it become a big problem in the city of Toronto with the shootings? It became a big problem when shootings started happening in places they weren't supposed to happen. Yes or no? Yes. Yes, right. So let me ask you this. Where are shootings supposed to happen? This has been a theme that we've learned, all right? And, and the reason I bring that up, the shootings, not to trick anybody, is, is we had that realization to be like, oh, wait a minute, because I remember when I first got hired as a police officer and you got sent to your division and you got told, you know, you're day one on the road, this is where you're going. We all knew the gang areas, right? So you knew like, oh, you're gonna be in these divisions, these are where the gangs are, so you expect that type of crime. And when those crimes happen, you're like, well, yeah, this is a gang area. And the reason I bring that up is, is, and this is not the fault of anybody, but it's to bring reality to this is, we can't just attack the non-gang areas now and say, this place are no longer going to be shootings. We need to isolate them back to your neighborhood. There has to be zero tolerance everywhere. See, regardless of where you're from or what intersection or what you think the, the reputation is, <coughs> it's not happening anymore among everybody. I mean, I'll tell you who everybody is, but it's got to be a zero tolerance. All right, and the real issue with this is, I'll give you a, a mathematical number to this. So I want you to think about this. For the first year, our deputy chief would call our office and say, uh, what does the program look like? What does the program look like? And every month we'd say, I don't know, I don't know. And then afterwards, after a few months, we said, there is no program. And the reason why there isn't a program is because of this. We have five risk factor categories, right? You have family, school, peer group, individual, and community. Okay, and each of those, there's a combined 36 risk factors. So if I were to say to you this, we have, we'll just work with the number five. We have five different sets of problems that combined make a huge issue and I were to have one solution for five problems, I'd be a billionaire, I wouldn't even be here. Because uh, let's look at this mathematically for any of the mathematicians out here. If you have five different things, let's just use colors, black, white, purple, blue, orange, and I were to say, how many different combinations of five can we make, what would you say? It's a lot, right? I'll tell you, 3,125. So if you have 3,125 potential different combinations of social issues and psychological issues and personal issues that result in a greater problem, and I had one solution, I wouldn't be here. I'd be on Oprah Winfrey Network, for sure. I'd be out of here. Why do you Oprah Winfrey? Because, because I think that's the gold standard, and I aim for the top. All right, nothing gets higher than Oprah Winfrey, all right? That's where I'd be. Now, we look at those 36 risk factors. The 36 risk factors on its own mathematically, if I were to take different combinations, is 150 unvigatillion, which is 150 with 69 zeros after it. So people love to use the word gang. And we use it out of necessity. It's not a gang issue. It's a human issue. So it's a very much humanitarian effort. But we use the word gang because it takes four letters and simplifies 150 unvigatillion problems into a four-letter, <laughs> nice, compact word because our minds... <coughs> Our minds deal with surface level problems very easily. But we have to look at this matter not in width, but in depth. So this is an in-depth exploration of what's actually happening. Now, these risk factors, the question became, at the very beginning when we did these, uh, we gave it a bit of a test pilot with all these risk factors. We have the sheet, we give them out to people and we say, okay, fill it out and uh, just fill out what you want to do. And we, we'd given it to police officers. 
So fill it out the best as you can and let's see what comes back. And it was pretty crazy because some police officers scored very high, 20 plus on the risk factor chart. So the question became, how did you end up as a police officer and not a gang member? Remember I said we're all kind of the same? Yeah, we are. All right, the difference is between police officers and gang members is we had something called protective factors, which all of us had. And those protective factors show themselves in different things. For myself, it was coaches, it was teachers, it was the one-off conversations I had with somebody who I respected that really put that expectation in me. I can look back at that now as a, as a 37-year-old man and look back and say, okay, those are the moments that I valued in my life. But if you don't have the protective factors to balance out these risk factors, you're going to have some big issues that you might not be able to come back from. You might not even make it to 21 if you score 36 out of 36. And then we expanded it from there. So we found this beautiful model in the United States. It's called the Spruggle model or the Comprehensive Gang model. And we looked at, I would looked at hundreds of different models to prevent gangs and to prevent this stuff. And while across the world we found no successful way to get a gang member out of a gang, what we did find was, was hundreds of things you could do to prevent kids from the age of zero to 21 become gang involved. What can you do for them and their family? And those risk factor categories, they're brought up here. And our, our model, while it says gang prevention, it's actually made up of four things. Number one is education. So we stay in the books as much as possible. I have two days a week I dedicate to reading just to make sure I'm in, uh, up to date as to what's happening and liaising with other law enforcement from all over the world that are in the gang space. I say, what are you guys doing? What are you learning? And we, we give that out. All right, we're transparent with what we know. If you go to our website, torontogangprevention.ca, it's all on there. Every publication I've referenced is on that website for anybody to read. It's on there. And what we also found was that there's three other things you got to look at. Prevention, intervention, and suppression. These are all important things to look at. So our gang prevention model actually has four pillars. Education being one, which stays throughout. Second one is prevention. And the reason why prevention is there between the family and the peer group is because that's when prevention strategies actually work the most effective. You're looking at sometimes 50, 60% returns on prevention strategies. If we can get the kids between the ages of zero and 12 and really get into the prevention space, how do we identify the risk factors? I mean, look at family. You got eight problems to deal with there. Eight problems. We have influential kids. They're already easily influenced. They're looking for guidance and direction. It's, it's not difficult to get into that space and to curb that behavior. Prevention works there. And then as you go along, we got intervention. All right, intervention is something that never gets talked about. And I, I, it's not... This should actually be on the law enforcement end, uh, gang intervention task force. I'll tell you why. If you're part of a gang, you're almost at a 20 to 70% chance to reoffend. Okay, which means you do crime, you're going to go to jail, you're going to come out, you're going to do another crime. You're at a heightened risk to reoffend. While we're focused on prevention, which is the number one place to be, number one, we can't neglect the intervention. What about the tens of thousands of people currently in the criminal justice system that are in and out, in and out, in and out? What about them? You cannot negate them. They're part of there. If we don't aggressively provide them outreach and figure out what's happening and address these risk factors and provide them productive factors, we're just going to grow that problem because they're the ones that are grooming young kids. They're the ones bringing in the dope. They're the ones pulling the trigger and doing all the shootings. We can't neglect that. And that, again, is the best at uh, 9 to 18. And then we go to the last one, which is suppression, which is 15 and up. And what suppression is is this. you got to let police do what we do. Number one way in the world to combat gang violence is to arrest the people committing the violence. That's it. You have to hold people accountable for what they do. But our strategy is not to hold everybody accountable. I'll tell you why. You're going to be held accountable, but who's going to get the hammer? It's not everybody. It's about 10% of the gang population. And that number was not something we just made up. The study done of a gang in Los Angeles, 300 gang members. And what they found was only 10% of that gang was responsible for everyday criminal decision making. Only 10%. 30 out of the 300 were the real criminals. The other 90 or 270 gang members, they had an average gang membership of two to three years, and they were always out on their own. There was no outside influence in terms of government agency. This was not a government initiative that took these people out of life. What took them out of that life was they were a victim of crime, they had a friend that died, they met a girl, they went to university, they went to school, their parents moved. It was all personal things that led them to leave. Now our goal on the suppression end is to identify the 10%, not the 100 so even as law enforcement, we talk about organizational change, it's about going after the top 10% of gang members, not the 90%. For the police officers in the room, I'll ask you here, night school robbery. All right, and this is a scenario that uh, I'm sure if, if you've done a couple years on the job, you've had this experience. Night school robbery, and I'll give you, for everybody else, this is exactly what happens, all right? Kids go to night school, one guy's got a brand new iPhone. Three kids robbed this kid for the iPhone. 
Okay. The kid who gets robbed goes to the principal. I just got robbed. Who robbed you? Jim, John, and Jennifer. Okay. He knows them. They grew up together. They go to regular school together, but he gets robbed. He tells the principal, well, John beat me up and he took my phone, but Jim and Jennifer were with him. The principal calls police. Jim, Jennifer, and John robbed my student, took his iPhone. Now, it's night school. Most night schools, you know the one way in, one way out. He knows the name. We know where they live. So what we do is, in, in our cases, sometimes we just go to the person's house and we wait till they show up at home, or we check local areas. Well, let's say we come across, we come across these three. We arrest all three of them. Jim, John, and Jennifer, you arrest them for robbery. We arrest them. We find the cell phone of the victim. Case closed. We got them. All right? But here's the back end to it. The kids, when they come back to the police station, the police officers, two kids are crying one kid is not. Two kids are saying, man, you know, Jennifer and Jim are saying, man, we didn't even know what was happening. We were there. Yeah, we, we saw it happen. We didn't see anything. We left with them, but we were just there. And then John's stone cold sober. John's not saying anything. We look at John. John's got a criminal record, criminal history. We look at the other two. They have nothing. All three get charged because that's what we do. That's what you're supposed to do. And all three get charged and they all get put on bail conditions, which means they get put on conditions where after they get arrested, they can't hang out with each other. But they grew up together. They live together. Right? They go to school together. So now what happens is all three get separated from schools. But this is the only group of friends they know. And then what happens is we catch them a month later hanging out at a convenience store. And they're all breaching conditions. And they get rearrested on a whole new set of charges. And we're just, we're just making this, man. We're just making this. And the idea with this is to, if I were to give you that same example, John, Jim, and Jennifer, John did all the dirty work. Who's the 10%? Who's probably most responsible for that? John, right? Jim and Jennifer crying in the police station at the age of 15. Realistically, is that something we, we want to do? I understand there's, there's exceptions to every rule, and we got to start exercising some, some bigger picture thoughts here, right? What are the bigger impacts here? If they're okay, they're okay. People make mistakes. There's other legal things we could do with it, and we do, but it's really promoting that organizational change. Now, all these things, they lie in this pool, all right? And this pool is this. This pool is made up of five ingredients. Community mobilization being exactly what we're doing now. I talked to you guys before, and I said, listen, man, we can come in here and waste our time trying to build relationships with communities that have historically not trusted the police for valid reasons all into their own. There's, n there's nothing I'm going to do. You might like me. You might like Dale. But you don't like the Toronto police. That's cool. I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm okay swallowing that. I'm fine with it. But... These type of things here is to find the community leaders to say, you got it. You got the influence. You got the trust. You got the motivation. What can we do to empower you guys in your own neighborhood? You tell us what the issues are here. Let us connect you to a massive network. We don't want the credit. When I'm done this, I'm done this. I do not want to be in front of a camera again. I do not want to be on social media. I don't want to do any of this stuff anymore because it takes me so far away from what I really want to do. And that what I want to do is put a dent in this problem and build other people up. And that's the goal for this. Second to that, you have opportunities provisions. Those gang members that we're dealing with, regardless of either the 10 or the 90%, are they unintelligent people, for those of us that have experience with them? They're intelligent. I want you to think about how smart you have to be, how good you have to be with people to, to have a 15-year-old pick up a gun for you and to go deal with drugs. You got something in you. And in all of the gang members I have dealt with in my career and everybody I speak to, they've had a low attachment to school. All right, low attachment to school, it's a connection issue there. Now, school also has an obligation to the education system to start adopting the certain changes to start maybe updating the <laughs> curriculum to say, what can we do for these kids that don't have any connection to school? Are there other opportunities out there? Like for myself, uh, being a parent of immigrant kids, I had five options in life. These are my five options, doctor, engineer, lawyer, police officer, or failure, okay? And for you here, grew up, what were your options? When you were a kid, what did they tell you had to be? Same. What about you? Same. Anything. You're lucky. And you chose to be here January 2nd, 2020. <laughs> right? I had limited options. Honestly, if I had known I had other options, I would not have been a cop. But I didn't know. All right? It's the same thing with these guys. We look at kids in these neighborhoods. It's my favorite example. Is uh, I don't know this side of the city too well. All right? I'm a West End guy. One. Right? And who usually goes in there? Is it employees from the local businesses or is it community members? Sorry? Mostly employees, right? And shoppers and Yeah. 
but it's not residents. So you have low income areas, you have kids who have low attachment to school, you have parents that are struggling to work two or three jobs to make ends meet because they have multiple children. And forget that fact, okay? I know I've heard people say they shouldn't have that many kids. Guess what? It's already here. That's beyond, that's not even part of the conversation here. Point is, you got that all this. Now, here's a th beautiful thing. It's a relatively high paying job. They're a global organization. There is a hierarchy in the inside so you can move up, and they pay for education. And they're not in our area. So if is not even in the vicinity of eyesight for kids going up in these areas, what is the expectation they're gonna branch out to be a doctor, lawyer, engineer, police officer, or failure? But you're also talking about role models. I'm talking about opportunities. But they don't have anybody in their neighborhood. Well, they do have role models. Who are the role models for gang kids? They're there. Yeah. So when we talk about opportunities provisions, the real issues on, on a very deep level lie outside of what are the opportunities outside of you for the gang members uh, that we've dealt with a lot of them have not gone past the city block they have no idea what is north of them in, in Rexdale for example there is a, a school that I was a, a school officer in in 2008-2010 I was a school officer I asked for the school because it was the most violent school quote unquote in our area so I said if I'm going to do this give me the hardest when I got into there, I ended up getting to know a whole bunch of gang members. And just two kilometers north of the school, not even a kilometer north of the school, is Woodbridge. And I remember asking the kids. Uh, that's not a gang there, right? So <laughs> my, my, my point is, my point is I had kids from Rexdale. And when I said a kilometer north of you is a whole other city, I said, have you been up there? It is, 100%. You got you to gotta expand that mind to a global level. You know, if, if a kid who hasn't even traveled a kilometer and a half north to Woodbridge, what, what are we expecting here, man? This kid's going to become a rocket scientist? Like, again, that's why I say at the beginning when I say, sometimes we say things to make ourselves feel good. You're doing this entire operation a disservice by making yourself feel good. It's actually a very selfish thing to do. A better thing to do is to say, where can I contribute? What's the actual responsibilities here? What can I do? And I'm not saying everybody has to do everything, but at the same time, I'm saying everybody has to do everything. That's a reality to it. If you're impacted by this, you have to do something. I'll sometimes go to corporations and we'll talk about what we're doing because we have a whole separate side of this where it's an engagement side to the franchise community. And when I ask in that room and I say to a room of executives or whoever and I say, okay, who here is impacted by gangs and I don't see a single hand rise, that's perfect for me. Because then my follow-up question is, who avoids certain pockets of the city of Toronto on the way into work because of the violence? So for anybody to say, I'm not gang impacted, they're wrong, they're 100% gang impacted.